Thanks everyone for coming out. Nice to see all that, those many happy faces. So you can write a link tracker in the weekend, or at least that's what I thought. I'm Matthias. I'm an open source developer. Recently, I became a Rust consultant. This is my consultancy. This is not a talk only to Rust developers. So even if you're not a Rust developer, you should be able to get something out of it. The reason why I started this project was that a couple years ago, I looked for a linter. A linter is a tool that helps you improve your code. And it turns out that there are quite a lot of linters. I started to write down all of the linters that I found into a markdown file, and I pushed it on GitHub. Didn't think much about it. And a couple years passed, and this list grew into what you see here. And every linter has a website, and the link to the website can break. And this is what I wanted to fix, because people would tell me that the website link was broken, and then I needed to go and manually fix it. So I thought, how can I automate that? And the easy way would be to write my own link checker. So this is what I did. I had a YouTube channel in the past. It was called Hello Ross. Not sure if the microphone is working perfectly, but if you can hear me, then it's fine. Just checking. And yeah, I live coded it in a weekend. And it sort of worked. So I got to work. I did all of this. And at the end, I had a tool which you could run from the command line. You can watch the video. It's still online. At the end of the day, you run it from the command line, and it has a couple commands. For example, you can say, dump all the links that include GitHub. Or you can say, check all the links in the readme. Gives you a progress bar. And it has verbose output for different formats. And so on and so on. So it has quite a lot of features. Yeah, it seems like it's going down and <laughs> it's going in cycles, but yeah. You will figure it out. Yeah. Litchi was born. Litchi, this is how you pronounce it. Oh, maybe I should maybe I should use this one then, huh? Because this one is better. Okay. <laughs> you were about to say. No worries. It's more official anyway, because now I look like the US president. <laughs> State of the nation. It, the, the project name should not be hard to pronounce for an Italian. So it's Litchi, not Lychee, Litchi. Does anyone know this person? That's Daniel Stenberg. And he is the author of Curl. And Curl is a tool that is used by billions of devices, literally. It runs in your car. It runs on your washing machine. And he has been working on Curl since, we just checked with Alessio today, since 1996. And all he does is write Curl. And still, people say that you could rewrite Curl in a weekend, or you can do it in 100 lines. And he found it, that it was so funny that he created this website to collect all of these memes, all of these remarks. And just today I checked, because he has another website, because I checked for curl memes, and he collects curl memes. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized he has a meme by me. So yeah, that was nice to see. So I think this is really true. Curl powers the web. And a lot of people say you can build it in a weekend. This is the same set of people that has never done anything in a weekend. So just because you say you can do something doesn't mean you can necessarily do it. And also, what does it mean to write curl or write a link checker? It's a long task. You probably want to scope it. And also, just as a remark, I like the gophers. This is not a competition here. But the tool is written in Rust. And there are a couple reasons for it. Well, usually what you hear when people talk about Rust, it's it's native performance, it is fearless concurrency, zero cost abstractions, minimal runtime, it's cross platform, it's self contained, yada, yada, yada. I would say on this list, 
the only thing Litchi really cares about is the amazing networking ecosystem and robustness. Performance is a subset of robustness, I would say. At least it kind of results when you build something that is really robust, then you can optimize it and make it concurrent, for example. This is what Rust allows you to do. But really, I guess you could write the same tool in any language. For example, Go. And there's nothing wrong with this. But the upside of Rust in this specific case is that it came from developers that build stuff for the web. So the first use case of Rust, maybe some of you know, is Servo, or it was Servo. It was a browser engine written by Mozilla to be not a replacement of Firefox, but to integrate some of the functionality into Firefox eventually. And the same engine powers Litchi now. So Litchi is kind of browser great, quote unquote, because it uses the same engine, not because, yeah, it's necessarily an amazing tool, but it is based on this work from other amazing people. And similarly, it uses Tokyo, which is a runtime. In Rust, you can use futures, and futures are asynchronous tasks that get executed at some point, and you can run a lot of these tasks concurrently, and that allows you to fill out the network card requests without really doing much work. And this is exactly what we do. So Tokyo uses, uh, Litchi uses the Tokyo e ecosystem very heavily. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is a markdown parser that was initially created, initiated by uh, Ref. I don't think he's here today, but yeah. It is the most amazing Google Thing, maybe a uh, markdown parser that is out there, I guess. I really liked it, and, and Litchi uses it too. Now, of course, in order to write a link checker, you need to understand two things. What is a broken link, and what is a link, essentially? I guess we can start with the first, the second part. What is a link? Well, I guess when I say link, everyone understands what a link is. That's not the problem, right? This is a link. This is what you would show to your grandma and say, oh yeah, this is how the internet works. We have links, and then we connect through those links, right? But really, as engineers, we know that there's many, many different links, many more links. For example, this is also a link. Because www is just a convention. It's actually just a subdomain. And if you get rid of it, it would still be a link. What about this? Is this still a link? Yes. The schema is missing, but the browser can infer that, right? What about this? No, this is not a link. <laughs> <laughs> Tricked you there. Because the browser doesn't know what schema that is. It's a colon without the schema. What about that? Yes, this is a protocol relative UI. I meant that. Yeah, you meant that. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, I would say that too now. But <laughs> <laughs> let's say you're on a website and then you see this, then the browser knows that it should use the exact same schema that it used to resolve the original website. So if you go to https example.com, and you have slash slash example.com slash foo, then it will also use HTTPS to resolve that. And if you used HTTP, then it will use HTTP. And this is nice because, let's say you transition from HTTP to HTTPS, then you can support both with both browsers, uh, with both schemas. Right, we established this, but what about that? <laughs> Do you just keep saying yes? like? <laughs> It's, it's kind of a hit of, or miss for you, but... <laughs> okay. It, it, it is not. Well, or is it? Who knows? Because really, the thing is, what does that even mean, example in this case? Well, I would say in a normal URL, that would be the host, right? But if it's the only thing, then it's the TLD. And this, for example, is a valid link. So if you open your browser and you go to AI, and you have to probably add a slash to it to make your browser uh, resolve it, then it will resolve to a website, to this website. 
And the reason is that someone decided that it's a good idea to have a TLD domain. So you can resolve it. And this is funny, I think. What about that one? <laughs> You're right, yes, yes. What could that be? What that could that resolve to? Oh, that would be a nice one. It's a commercial entity, though. Someone at Budweiser was extremely smart. For all we know, URLs have to be ASCII, right? So this is not a valid link. Well, of course it is. So URLs don't have to be ASCII. They can be anything. They can be Unicode, or actually Punicode in our situation. And this is also a TLD, and I think it means Arabic. There's someone who tried all of the TLDs and just checked which one resolved to actual URLs. And I think this is brilliant. So there's a couple. You can try them. Maybe not all of them will work anymore, but they used to be. What can you do with links other than shortening them? You can also lengthen the links, right? This is also a valid link. Now, if, if anyone can really resolve the parts of that, you're a magician. But there's a lot of these things. So this is the exact explanation for it. And you can see we got a, we got a scheme, we got a username, we got a password, and so on. You don't need to necessarily be able to read this. But just so that you know, this is a valid link as well. And there's an entire blog post about it, which I linked to. That's all fun and dandy, but really where it becomes a problem is when you work in a security context. For example, here, one link is valid, and the other one is malicious. Which one is the malicious link? Why? The slashes are different. Some, some of you have really keen eyes. That's true. Yeah, one is a slash, but the top one is a Greek divide. Yeah. And why does it work in the first place? Because Google decided that .zip was a nice domain name. So now not even developers are safe from links anymore. So don't laugh at your grandma when she clicks on something uh, malicious again, because it can happen to us too. But I mean, these are URLs. URLs are complicated. Really what is easy are email addresses. Everyone knows how email addresses look like. That's an email address. Is that an email address? Yes, it is, because it turns out, same trick as for URLs, you can have an email address or a URL, I guess, if you own a TLD. So in this case, for TT, for example, this works. If, if you have mail at TT, then it can be resolved like this. And I don't want to bore you with all of the edge cases for email addresses. You can look up the list on the internet. There are pages and pages of descriptions. And I just think this is really funny as well, because you have so many edge cases that uh, parser somehow needs to handle, and a human understands, but maybe not a computer. And even for humans, it's sometimes very difficult. All we know about email addresses that we can be certain about is the at sign. So this is how we can differentiate between a URL and an email address. <laughs> Unless Medium decides that an at would be nice as a path parameter. Yeah. But I guess, still, the heuristic would be, if it contains an at sign, then it depends. If no, then no. <laughs> this is kind of the only rule you can come up with. Now, this is already quite complicated, but we also need to talk about the other part, which is brokenness. What is a broken link? I guess, intuitively, a lot of developers understand what a broken link is. Oh, it's just a 404. It's just not available. 
And if you start to write your own link checker, probably this would be the first check you would do. Now you say, if the status code is a 404, well, it's a broken link. Well, depends, right? Because what about 403? Is it broken just because you don't have permission to access it? And what about redirects? Well, then you say, okay, easy enough. Everything that is not a status code 200. Well, what about a 204, which is no content, I guess? Technically, it's not broken. It just doesn't resolve to any content. Well, then you say, well, OK, easy. Then I just say everything that is not a 2xx status code. OK, but again, um, it's not enough. There are things that are maybe outside of your control. And you end up with maybe checking everything that is above 400, because you say, well, OK, if it's above 400, uh, then it's some sort of error. So it's like a 404, or maybe it's a 500, which might be a server error. But really, this also doesn't cover it, because 500 errors are server errors. And just because a server replies with uh, an error doesn't mean that the link is broken. Maybe the website or the server itself is down. And then you say, oh yeah, you end up with such a ra uh, range. You say something between 400 and 500. But then you check a second later, and the link works again. And that means there's a temporal component to it. That means maybe you want to try more often. And how often do you try? And in which distances? Now, all of this would be nice. You probably could come up with rules. But the internet is the internet. It's a weird place. And that there are players that don't really like to play by the rules. I'm not looking at big corporations here, OK? Actually, why not? Let's look at big corporations, OK? <laughs> Let's say I work at LinkedIn. And I decide that I don't want people to crawl my page. What would be a nice status code to communicate that to the developer? Please stop crawling me. Well, you could say it's a 200 and it does give you an error message. Or you reply with a 404 or something, or maybe a 403. But what LinkedIn decided to do was, no, let's invent our own status code. <laughs> so when bot detection gets triggered on LinkedIn, you get a 999. And this, of course, was an issue with Litchi, and someone reported it. So there's an exception in Litchi just for LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn is weird, just in general, not only because of this. Then YouTube looked at LinkedIn and said, well, I can one-up you on this. How can I make it even worse for you? So I mean, LinkedIn at least gives you a status code. I don't return any status code at all that is valuable to you. What I will do is I will abuse a certain different status code to communicate something entirely wrong. For example, if you want to check a YouTube link, a YouTube video, then even if the video is not up, the tool will return a 200. So the video is down, but you still get a 200 error code. Even curl has that problem. For example, if you try to curl this uh, video, it will work. And if you curl the other video with just the letter Q at the end in lowercase, it will also work. But in reality, one of them is working and the other one is broken. And in Litchi, there's a workaround for this that came from a contributor that wrote a separate tool. And they said that the only certain way they found to check YouTube videos was to check the thumbnail. So if you check a video link, in fact, Litchi checks the thumbnail. Because the moment the thumbnail goes down, the video is also down. And it works consistently. Well, that's the weirdness of the internet, right? There's nothing weirder than that. <laughs> <laughs> of course there is. There always is someone who's even weirder than that. I have my own love-hate relationship with Twitter. I will call it Twitter for the rest of my life. I decided not to call it X. It's a weird name. And what they did was 
kind of strange too. They said, okay, we will cut off support for checking tweets through HTTP. So you cannot use their website anymore without JavaScript. And there used to be a workaround from the very nice people at Knitter. They had a static site. So you could go from Twitter.com, you replace that with Twitter uh, Knitter.net, and then it would show you the static version without any authentication, no login. Still works, yes. Works again, and does not work at scale. The moment you use it with millions of links, then you have a little problem. Yeah, so you kind of hammer their infrastructure as well. And this is a bit of a problem. So Twitter cannot be checked right now without JavaScript. Even you need to be locked in at this point. So sometimes I lay awake at night and I think about ways how to check Twitter links for everyone. Yeah, as I said, you need an account now. And that's, I guess, one story about open source. At the end of the day, you can't fix the web, so you need to find workarounds, and sometimes there is no workaround. But really, where problems arise is when you have links that should never break. Does anyone know what DOI links are? Oh, you're the dangerous ones. <laughs> Do you work in academia by any chance? Used to, yes. <laughs> the rest has no clue, see? This is kind of a problem with that infrastructure. DOI links are links that are hosted by a trusted organization. You can be a registrar, and then you can take registries from, for example, universities, and they host infrastructure for links that should never break. And you put them into research papers, and the idea is that you can refer to that in the future and it will always continue to work. Well, it turns out someone reached out to me and said, DOI links are broken. And I learned about this the hard way. I did not want to know how DOI links work. Well, this person is very, very delicate um, because he explained to me what the problems were and we discussed the options a bit. And I said, really, you cannot fix that because you would have to go to literally every publisher out there and you would have to send them emails and ask them to fix it. Like no human being would do that, I'm sorry. Well, then he said, if you don't mind, I would do it. So he just goes out and sends people emails like this, and it always starts with, your DOI infrastructure is broken, with a very clear technical uh, yeah, explanation on how to fix it. It's really cool. And yeah, he follows through, improving the web. It's really nice. People like this. This is not an actual photo. This is <laughs> <laughs> staged for the camera. Well, OK, now we talked about links. We talked about brokenness. Let's talk about my other favorite topic, which are edge cases. People in development roles usually think they know how to handle things, uh, how to program things. And sometimes this is because it's like the blessing of the ignorance. But even just parsing simple websites is really hard if you try to do it. Has anyone tried to parse a simple website? It is very hard. It is very hard. Why is that? Well, I guess we all started with websites like this, or at least I did. I opened my text editor. I typed something in. I saved it. And then suddenly, kind of magically, my browser was able to show the page. And it was so cool. And then later I found that I made a ton of mistakes, and it should not have worked. But in reality, it did. Why is that? Well, because the browser is really good at detecting such edge cases. For example, here, I'm just missing one angular bracket here. And still, the link works. That is really cool. You can even replace an entirely different tag with your original tag. So uh, actually, it's the other way around but you get what I mean. You replace an A with a diff, and it still works. The result would still be the same. This is great if you're on the receiving end. If you're the person who just wants to build a simple website, or you work at a company that builds websites, this is great. But if you're on the other side, and you build a browser or a tool like Litchi or Curl, then the parsing becomes kind of important. 
So from time to time, I get requests from people that report parsing errors, both in HTML, but also in Markdown. Remember, we also support Markdown documents. And Markdown is another rabbit hole. I don't want to go into the details, but I get issues like this, where people say, this gets detected as a link, and I'm like, what the hell went wrong? Like, how many things have to go wrong for this to be detected as a link? You don't want to know. Well, I took a screenshot of myself, like, I captured the camera when I saw the issue at the middle of the night. This is my life, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it, it becomes too overwhelming. And speaking of too overwhelming, this is an error code that you get as well, too many requests. You usually get that from API requests. Litchi does a lot of requests, and so we get a lot of 429s. This is the status code you get. And what is the proper solution to handle that case? Well, of course, there is a sane way to do that on the web. It doesn't only send you a 429, it sends you headers that you can use to infer when you can send the next request. Looks like this. It's very simple. It gives you a rate limit, so you can make 100 requests. You have 50 remaining, and the time to reset is 600 seconds. That's the official standard. Easy. You start to implement it, you're done. It works for every website. <laughs> of course not. Then Reddit comes around and says, well, I really like the standard. Or actually, before the standard came to be, they said, we want something similar. And they said, let's add an X minus in front of it, because it's an unofficial header. And let's just uh, keep that. And GitHub said, yeah, I really like it. Can we make it lowercase and <laughs> not make it seconds, but a Unix timestamp until you can make the next request? And GitHub said, I really like it. Let's add another header for the remaining requests you can take for some reason, because you can't calculate it, I guess. And the reset time should be in, micros in uh, microseconds, uh, milliseconds, sorry. And X said, well, I like it as well, but really, let's add the X minus, because actually I got used to it. And yeah, let's remove that other stupid header that you added, GitLab. OK, Vimeo is just out there somewhere. <laughs> But Akamai somehow liked it because they said, yeah, I really like a very explicit time format here. Uh, really what you would have to do is write a library to just parse all of these different things. And literally this is what I did. So <laughs> there is a thing, it's a Rust crate. It has many different implementations for all of that. And yeah, that's what you do. But really, I guess the websites are to blame here, because all they need to do is look up the documentation for the official spec and implement it. It's not that hard. You just go to the website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just when I wanted to show you the website, it's broken. So that screenshot is not from too long ago. And yeah, if you cannot look it up, kind of ironic, I guess. Especially with GitHub, it's a huge problem. And recently, we thought about a different way to do it. There is an algorithm called token bucket algorithm. You have n buckets in, oh, sorry, you have n coins in a bucket. You take one coin out when you make a request, and then this bucket gets refilled with new coins from time to time. And this is how you can have a stable number of requests over time. The other issue that we faced was bot detection. Turns out that if you don't use JavaScript, then some websites trigger bot detection algorithms. And there are even algorithms in curl which help you pretend to be a proper Firefox or Chrome browser by mimicking the TLS handshake. So they have an algorithm just for this, and they kind of spoof the TLS requests. And there is a Rust library for this as well. And we tried it. It has some edge cases, so we don't use it. but Suffice to say, JavaScript is a huge issue for such simple tools. But is it really? Let's look at a couple websites without JavaScript. Google works. If you type in JavaScript, you get results. So Google is a really solid player on the web. Well, unless you go to Google Maps, of course. Then somewhat ironically, they say, when you have limited the JavaScript, whatever remains must be an empty page. 
I read it and thought that was a punch in the face because that's not true. I wrote HTML before JavaScript. I'm that old. So it does work. Twitter said JavaScript is not available. They just declared defeat immediately. I liked the Bing the most, honestly, because they didn't lie. They said, ask me anything. They didn't lie. They just don't respond. So <laughs> this is all you get from Bing without JavaScript. Yeah, but Facebook even works better without JavaScript. This is the best feat I had in a long time. <laughs> So really, we went from HTML being too slow, so we move everything to JavaScript, until everything in JavaScript was too slow, so we pre-render pre all HTML, until we pre-render all HTML being too slow, so we need to render some pages on request, and then we render HTML on request. Yeah, we kind of went full circle here. Another thing, recursion. When do you stop checking websites? In fact, Litchi does not have recursion support. It's the most wanted feature, but it's also very, very hard to implement just because of this. You can use the sitemap XML, and you have to respect the robots TXT, but fundamentally, it's something that I would love to add. Recursion is something that a lot of people need. There are many, many edge cases like this. What if the server never responds? What if the response never stops? So you get one byte at infinitum. What if the server sends no Unicode? Can you handle non-Unicode stuff? What if you read a one terabyte file? Can you even fit it into memory? Well, if you can't, then you kind of need to stream line by line. What if you read a one terabyte line? So you cannot parse it line by line. And I really like this image. It's kind of a meme that I created on I call it the link checking iceberg model. Uh, we started at the top with HTTP status codes. I showed you that. And we talked a little bit about performance. We talked about redirects. We talked about JavaScript. And then we went into the deeper realms of the ocean. We went into URL parsing. And we did not talk about cookies. We didn't talk about file encoding. We did not talk about proxies and single page applications. We talked about the token bucket algorithm, though. But we didn't talk about control theory. At the end of the day, this is me trying to explain to my girlfriend why I need the weekend off to work on Litchi. It's like, yeah, it's always just one last feature. <laughs> how hard can it be? Almost done. You might be wondering, how does this thing look like? And it's really unimportant. It's, in my opinion, kind of boring code. But if you look at the diagram, it looks extremely scary. So. You have a runtime, which triggers a collector, and the collector triggers an executor. And the executor has support for different formats, like HTML and Markdown. And then we stored some of that stuff in a cache. We call it the fragment cache, because I will get to that in a second. And then on the other side, we trigger that at runtime. So we have a client, which does some remapping. So you can use it for internal URLs, and does some filtering. And it applies the quirks that I showed you before. And then it does the actual check. Uh, fragments, by the way, are these things. You might have seen them before. They show up in some websites. You can link to them directly, so we support them. Yeah, since it's written in Rust, one valid question might be, is it fast? Well, depends on what you compare it with, because there really isn't that much of a comparison to begin with. So I tried to run it on a couple websites. In fact, I tried to run it on many, many more, but turns out that most of the tools kind of died before, so I had to limit the scope a little. What you see is um, on the left side, you have AwesomeBot, you have Lish, then you have Litchi, then you have Linkinator, Link Checker, and Markdown Link Check, which is a popular one as well. And the y axis is the number of seconds it takes to check all of those links. We only check 1,500 in the highest case. When you see zeros, this is when the tools die. So the only one that comes close is Lish, which is written in Go. So yeah, it is relatively fast. And we use it on millions of links, actually. Well, but this is part of the code. Mm, not sure if you can read it. But in Rust, you can use streams. And this is all stream-based. So this is the part that collects the links and returns it as a stream. 
And you can see we have two blocks here, and those run asynchronously. In fact, they run concurrently. You um, fetch the contents from all of the inputs concurrently, and then you go over all of the extracted comp contents, and then you try to extract the links from there, and you put that into a pipeline for Litchi to check. But the code itself is not that important. It doesn't really matter if it's Rust or Go, to be honest. It wasn't the point of the talk. Guess what's more important is who uses it. Turns out that a lot of companies use it, and you might know some of them. And it has somewhat become critical infrastructure for them, I guess. We check around 2 million links, maybe more, per week. And I wanted to also use that opportunity to quickly touch on critical infrastructure. Well, here's the point. Is Litchi really critical infrastructure? It's just a tool by a random guy on the internet, right? But kind of it's a small thing that people use to check their documentation, and really it solves a problem for them. And if Litchi itself isn't critical infrastructure, then at least the web is. So we should make sure that we ourselves take care of our own business and fix our links. Does anyone remember that page? This is the million dollar website. Every pixel cost one dollar. So people had an interest to make sure that these links would work. They paid for it. How many of these links still work today? There's research on this. The orange part is broken. The green one still works. And the blue one is redirects. When I first saw this, I was like, 25%? That's OK. I was surprised. This website is like many years old. But then I thought, really? Is it really? And then I started to look at some of the working links. And <laughs> it's correct. They work. <laughs> but it wasn't the response I was expecting. And I guess you can all tell why they are kind of broken. But detecting this with a broken link checker is almost impossible. You would have to need the human understanding to understand if this is real content or if it's a landing page, a parked page or so. And this is a fundamental problem for the internet itself because 50% of all cited links in the Supreme Court um, opinions no longer point to the intended page. And roughly 70% of cited links in academic legal journals suffer from link rot. And that is the infrastructure we depend on. This is the infrastructure we use for our legal systems. And this is certainly critical infrastructure. That's why I want to point out two amazing things, if you did not know them before. One is the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine stores cached versions of pages. Funnily, they have an explanation page on what they do. And they have this really intriguing link to the Library of Alexandria. And if you click on it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ironic. The other one is PermaCC, which is an entity, a commercial entity, which I guess was started by Harvard. And you can also register there to have your links working forever. But even that is broken, so <laughs> <laughs> that's on their issue tracker. As I said, I wanted to add recursive support, but really there's no incentive from a um, company perspective. No one really pays me for this. And this is a problem, because there are many, many different things like this, which might be critical infrastructure for you, for your project. And I just wanted to raise awareness for that. I talked to Sebastian Siwota, who is at this conference, and he said, the reward of good work is more work. And that is certainly true. Sometimes this is how I feel <laughs> as an open source developer. <laughs> or maybe this. Yeah. Yeah, this is how a lot of open source developers feel. And this is why I want to also just really quickly thank people that supported Litchi and worked on some of the parts of it. For example, there's Orhun, who's also at the conference, by the way. And he manages the ARC package for it, thanklessly. And then I had a colleague, Jörg, who or I, like, I had. He's no longer my colleague, but he still is alive. <laughs> is what I want to say. And he wrote a, lap, a rapper around uh, Litchi for Python. And it's really cool. So he learned Rust this way. You can check websites. 
and then you can analyze the results. So what he does here, he gets a list, and he gets an item, the first item from the list, and then he has a couple helper methods on the request, and then you can format it in a, uh, a way however you want. This is the open source side. There's also an academia side. There was a bachelor's thesis last year by uh, Benny Cho and Thomas. And what they did was they took Litchi and they applied it to academia and to research papers and they maybe checked broken links there and did some analysis. They also contributed to the project. Thomas is now also part of the maintainers and he found an opportunity to do that as part of his job now, so I really like that. He's building a tool to check Confluence links because it turns out there is none or no good one and it uses Litchi under the hood, which is really cool. I think this is what I really wanted to say. Um, it's not about the project necessarily, it's about open source. I would say if you have an idea for a project, just give it a shot, solve your own problem, start small, don't even think about making it a huge thing. Um, if you have passion, if you're interested in it, people will join you and maybe if you talk about it, maybe someone will find it interesting. Yeah. And also, speaking of which, if you want to find out more, there's some documentation on litchicli.rs. And with that, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Sa, sa. Sa, sa. Okay. <laughs> Did anybody? Okay. Sa, hey. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? No. Okay. Throw up. Ah, okay. Uh, a question about um, the rate limiting crate that you wrote. Did you think initially you could write that over a weekend? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't think it would take two years, but maybe a little longer than a weekend. Yeah, maybe a long weekend. Coming back to this original blog post, and a three-day weekend would have sufficed, but no, it wasn't that easy. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how do you know how many links are checked with Leech every week? How do you count that? I only know the public projects. And what I did was I scraped all of the projects and I extracted the links once. And then I went ahead and took, uh, checked their GitHub Actions pipelines and I saw how often they would run. And then I got my estimate. And then recently a big company reached out to me and said, oh yeah, we basically do that next, like we do about the same amount in a closed source project. And I'm like, okay, they don't know about this. So it's probably way, way more than that. Mm. Every time I talk to someone, they say, oh, yeah, I tried to use it, or I use it, or, yeah, it's pretty cool, and, yeah, it's kind of weird. Never really announced it. So what about async? Are you doing any, like, high-level magic there, or is it mostly just request and uh, relying on the speed there? Yeah, it's... Mostly requests. We found a couple bugs in requests, which we fixed, which is great. <laughs> it turns out if you check a lot of links, you will also <laughs> run into a lot of bugs, which helps the broader ecosystem. Request itself is nice. It, I would assume it also has a funding issue. There would be opportunity for a company to sponsor a request because it has become critical infrastructure for the Rust web ecosystem at least. And yeah. There's really not much else you could do. You could write your own wrapper around it. It would be a lot of work, I guess. And we tried a couple alternatives to request. We came back to it because it was sort of a nice mixture between pragmatism and it handled many, many edge cases already for us, which many other things didn't do. Mm, yeah, sometimes I wish there were a couple more things in requests that I'm lacking right now that I wish uh, would exist, but yeah. Apart from that, it's pretty solid, and 
I like it. I like the work they put in. So yeah. do you have like a huge collection of futures which get the pages? Or how, how do you manage so many requests at the same time? Yeah. So this is kind of what I wanted to show here. This is more or less the core of it, almost, where you get inputs, then you read them asynchronously. So in the meantime, you can still check requests, of course. And then once you parse an input, you can extract links from this input with your parsers, for example, with Servo or with the Markdown parser. In Servo, they use a thing called HTML5 Ever. And there's a new one called HTML5 GUM, which is written by Markus Unterwanditzer from uh, Sentry. And it's stream-based, and it's a little faster, I would say. So we use that, actually, now. We support both. And yeah, then it gets into a pipeline. And we do some shenanigans there, filtering out some stuff. And then it reaches a stream, which can be consumed by the checker itself, yeah. Yeah, if you ask me if I would change anything in the architecture, I would say yes. There's a lot of things that I would do differently now, probably simplifying the abstractions even. If you could make it easier, then it would be easier to maintain. So technically, what you do is you really don't really care what it, a request is. It can be anything. What I'm building is almost like a browser engine, so something that is working asynchronously on random payloads that can come from many places, and then you handle them sort of efficiently, I guess. And you validate them with external things. So I guess a new version of Litchi would probably heavily use WebAssembly and do all of the logic inside WebAssembly. And then Litchi would just be a runtime for these WebAssembly payloads. And then as a company, you could write your own scripts in whatever language you want and validate however you want. Because then you can get rid of these issues here. Like, you can write your own logic, for example. If you wanted to check affiliate links for Amazon, then you can write some JavaScript and check if the affiliate links work. And then that doesn't have to be a part of Litchi. And maybe we will integrate WebAssembly support soon. Uh, didn't really answer your question, but I'm glad you asked. <laughs> When talking about links, you mentioned emails. Does Litchi somehow check email reachability? Yes, and it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate? <laughs> emails. Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, vendors will block you if you check emails. And they will put you on a blacklist, which means you cannot send emails through them anymore if you don't pay attention. And that can happen. And there are services out there that do that. And you will find that what they allow you to do is very limited. So they only allow you to check five or 10 email addresses, and that's it. So it's kind of a dangerous area, unfortunately. And I wish it was as easy as checking websites, but it's a whole other can of worms. We use a crate for that, which runs infrastructure. And yeah, it works. It can check most of the things, but it cannot send actual emails for being, exact, uh, for being really sure about it. Also, even if the email reaches your inbox, doesn't mean that you necessarily know about it. Or how do you know about it from the outside? If someone would have to reply, and then yeah, this message could also be lost. So it's kind of a tricky problem. Yeah, but it does check emails, yes. Probably will be optional at some point, because right now it is opt-out, but I want it to be opt-in, because it causes a lot of problems if you have many email addresses. Companies don't like that. That's a TLDR. Thank you. The example you showed that um, <coughs> the browsers are doing a good job in this. Didn't you ask Mozilla for getting their code to do it? Because it should be open source too. Uh, yeah, Maybe it is. If you're lucky. Yeah, it is, and we do. So we use their code. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we use a library called HTML5 Ever, which is part of Servo, and it was developed to build the next browser engine. So they really did all of the work to make it robust, and we can profit from this. 
So in the diagram, in the architecture diagram, which is way too small, I apologize, but it can see at the top, next to this database thing, we have HTML5 ever and HTML5 gum. So HTML5 ever is the one from Servo. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I'm afraid our time is over. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing uh, your work with us. Thank you all. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. <laughs>